to be able to talk to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to basically tell the same story that Anil and Kevin told yesterday, uh, but using the language of physics in the first half and neuroscience in the second half. And I should apologize for this because it's going to be um, my basic talk or starting from first principles. My hope is that many of the ideas that I heard you discussing yesterday um, are fully licensed and endorsed by this um, rather elemental or basic approach um, as seen through the lens of a physicist. Furthermore, the reason that I or my uh, and my colleagues commit to this kind of explanation is if you understand the underlying mechanics and the physics of what's going on, it allows you to simulate things. So I'm justifying some of the technical details in this talk um, on the basis that if you can actually write down the kinds of processes and phenomena of interest, then you're now in a position to simulate and provide proof of principle. And my hope is that at some point, um, the agenda, the fascinating and challenging agenda that your group is um, applying itself to may succumb to this kind of modeling and proof of principle. But I think that's going to be for you to decide. So this talk's going to be breathless because I, I, I have to complete it within uh, 45 minutes. Um, we're going to cover the statistics of life with a special focus on Markov blankets and how they induce an interpretation of self-organization in terms of inference and a very basal kind of belief updating, namely Bayesian uh, belief updating. Um, and then we're going to move on to a rehearsal of exactly the same story but um, from the point of view of neurobiology in terms of predictive coding and how they play out on neuronal networks. And then if we have time, I want to just speak to the uh, core notion of selfhood um, and argue that that may be intimately related to agency and then ask, well, where does agency emerge from um, the formulation that I will have established in, in the first two bits of the talk? So I'm going to start with a question posed by Schrodinger. How can events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism, be accounted for by physics and chemistry? Uh, clearly, I'm not going to address that question, but what I want to do is just pick out this notion of a spatial boundary and note that in order to talk about anything, a particle or a person or a priest, you have to be able to distinguish or separate or individuate that thing from everything else in virtue of it possessing a boundary. And Schrodinger would be the first to acknowledge that boundary is in, a, in, on, uh, in itself a statistical uh, object. And I'm going to read that boundary as something called a Markov blanket. So for those of you who don't know, who don't know what a Markov blanket is, um, imagine some little universe, and these are the states of the universe. And these states influence each other, and these influences are denoted by these arrows or edges. And imagine we take some states, say my states, my internal states. So the Markov blanket is effectively um, a set of states that constitute the, or constituted by the parents, the children, and the parents of the children as defined by this causal coupling. And in brief, the role that the Markov blanket plays is that it provides all the information that I would need about the universe to predict how I am going to change or evolve next. Technically, um, conditioned upon these states here, the blanket states here, the internal states are conditionally independent of the external states. And I'm going to make a, a further move here. I'm going to divide these blanket states into sensory states and active states, uh, where the sensory states influence but are not influenced by the internal states, active states influence but are not influenced by the external states and I motivate this particular partition um, in a moment uh, I use the word particular partition deliberately because in effect, in effect we've just described a particle or something more generally with particular states that constitute um, or are constituted by the blanket states and the sensory and active states and the internal states and this partition universal um, in the sense you can see it wherever you look. So here are two of our favorite things. Uh, at the top, there's a brain and the bottom, a single cell. We can imagine the internal states of the brain being everything I'd need to write down to 
uh, identify the current state of my brain, its activity, its connectivity, um, the internal states of the brain will influence my autonomic system, my active states, my actuators, which ter turn in turn change the external states that then couple back to the sensory states, my sensory epithelia, that then influence my internal states. And so the cycle continues. And exactly the same partition or sparse coupling can be found, say, in a single cell with intracellular states constituting the internal states that influence, say, the actin filaments that support the cell surface that is pushed into the external states and the external milieu reciprocates by changing, say, cell surface receptors that change the intracellular states. And again, establishing this circular causality that I uh, read in terms of an action perception cycle in relation to the brain. So that's the basic setup. What I want to do now is to do a very brief course in physics um, and then ask what would happen if we put the Markov blanket back into play. So I want to start with the basics of nearly all physics that we know, um, articulated here classically as a Langevin equation or a stochastic differential equation. I use the description stochastic deliberately because um, yesterday I noticed in the chat Dennis was was asking about fluctuations, random fluctuations, a kind of itinerancy that is characteristic of biotic self-organization. And those fluctuations are central to this argument that are denoted by omega here. And all we're doing here is just writing down a universe in which the rate of change of any states of this universe is determined by some flow, which is a function of where I am, plus these uh, itinerant or random fluctuations. And I've just sketched out two states here. So this could be um, an oscillation in uh, one cell of my brain. It could be my heartbeat, or it could be me getting up in the morning, doing my emails, having lunch, uh, watching television, and so on. At any temporal scale, the kind of systems that we are interested in show this characteristic property, that they have characteristic states, which they keep on revisiting. You can describe this um, in terms of uh, in random dynamical systems, a pullback attractor. Uh, you can articulate this in terms of physics, in terms of a non-equilibrium steady state. The key thing is to be something is to have characteristic states that I return to, or the, at least the neighborhood of. And thought of like that, we can now read this object as the probability that you'll find me in any particular state if you sample me at any random time. And that's important. It's important because we know a lot about the maths of the relationship between the dynamics, the flow, the amplitude of the random fluctuations, and this description of the state system in terms of its characteristic states or its pullback attractor. Um, don't worry about the equations. I'll just pick out what we need to know. Uh, this is a very generic equation known as the um, master equation in some contexts, the Schrodinger wave equation or the Fokker-Planck equation. More simply, just a description of how this probability density changes with time as a function of the amplitude of the random fluctuations, gamma, and the flows here. But we just said it doesn't change with time because I exist. So to use uh, Kevin's notion of persistence, I persist in time. So we know that this probability density doesn't change in time, which affords this solution here, known as the Helmholtz decomposition. Um, may sound very arbitrary, but this is absolutely fundamental. And I repeat, underwrites most of physics that we know from classical to quantum. Um, the, the key thing I want to look at, though, is that it describes what's known as a gradient flow on the log of this probability. In other words, in order to counter the random fluctuations, I have to be flowing towards my characteristic states in order to stop the probability density changing. And that's the key behavior that I want to pursue for the rest of the talk. Um, so at this point, let's put the Markov blanket back in play uh, and write down that gradient flow in terms of the amplitude of the random fluctuations. These things denote circular or solenoidal flows that give this kind of itinerancy and life cycles and oscillations. Uh, and it, what, what the Markov blanket tells you is that it is subject to the same law. And it means that the internal states and the active states will look as if they're trying to increase the log probability of, in this instance, the sensory part of the Markov blanket. 
And I'm going to interpret that in terms of perception and action respectively, and just ask the question, how would I then interpret this quantity here? Well, we've just said that the states that I'm most likely to occupy are those that are characteristic of me. Of me. They are literally the states that constitute my attracting set to which I am attracted. So they are valuable for me. They have meaning for me, um, uh, denoted by M here. Um, so one could read this log probability just as value, and one could spin off reinforcement learning if you're an engineer, optimal control theory, if you're an economist, expected utility theory. Um, if you're a free energy theorist, the negative variational free energy is just a way of writing down this value function. Um, if I just multiply this by minus one, we have a complementary perspective that people in, in information theory will recognize. So this is now known as this negative log probability that I'm now looking as if I'm trying to minimize is known as self-information, information theory, or more simply surprisal or surprise. It's just a measure of the implausibility that I would sense this given I am me. And this is the quantity that is bounded by the free energy, leading to things like the Infomax principle, the principle of minimum redundancy, and indeed the free energy principle. This is nice because the average of this thing is known as entropy. So the expected free energy uh, or self-information is entropy. So it'll look as if I'm trying to resist the second law by minimizing the dispersion or the entropy of my sensed states. And of course, that's the holy grail of self-organization in physics and synergetics of the kind described by Hermann Haken. Um, and indeed, if I was a physiologist, it would just be a statement of homeostasis. And I have to, to exist. I just have to keep my sensed physiological states within some viable um, uh, bounds that are existentially consistent and have meaning for me because they are characteristic states that I occupy. The final interpretation, which is the one I want to pursue, is that which would be given by a statistician. A statistician would read this not as the probability of some states given me, but me as a model of how my states were generated. This is known as model evidence, um, also known as the, um, the uh, marginal likelihood, having marginalized out all the external states that cause my uh, sensations. And therefore, perception and action will look as if we have... Mm -hmm. Uh, it is trying to accumulate or increase model evidence. And then uh, we can read off things like the Bayesian brain, evidence accumulation, and indeed predictive uh, coding. So I just want to um, illustrate now and try and demystify that last interpretation with a worked example, just to work towards something which I think may be very, uh, which may be a useful mathematical image of um, a system that is sort of self-caring and I'll, I'll motivate this and using the simulation in the following way. What we've done here is just simulate a lot of little macromolecules with strong repulsion and um, weak electrochemical attraction. Um, and their very existence in some metric space means that their coupling is sparse in that each molecule cannot see um, molecules a long way away. So because we've written down the dynamics here, we know the coupling, we can go into this synthetic soup and identify some internal states on their Markov blanket. In essence, what we're doing is we're asking the question, is there a little particle or thing living in this soup that is identifiable as something in virtue of the fact that it has a Markov blanket? And indeed there is in this synthetic soup. Uh, here the internal states are coded in blue. They're um, surrounded by the active, uh, the active states, say the active filaments, if this was a little viral or cell-like uh, structure, um, that underlie the sensory or the surface states that protrude into the external states in cyan here. So now we have a simulation, an in silico little thing, living at non-equilibrium steady state that we've identified because it's got its Markov blanket. The question is, what does it mean for it to be self-evidencing in the sense that it has to, on average, increase its Bayesian model evidence or the, uh, the evidence for its models of what's causing its sensory inputs. Uh, the answer is, is, is it's subtle, um, simple, and I think very interesting, simply because of this conditional independence that exists between the internal states and the external states. It means for any given internal state, there must exist 
a probability distribution over the external states, given the sensory states or the blanket states more generally. So what that means is there's a lawful relationship, a manifold or a function relation, relating my internal states to the probability distribution over my external states. And if I read that conditional distribution as a Bayesian belief, what that means is that these, these internal states, in some sense, hold or represent beliefs about the external states. And we can actually go in and just look at the nature of these beliefs. And what I've done here is articulate them in terms of something called a synchronization manifold, where all I've done is just plot the uh, some mixture of internal states um, uh, along the x-axis and the probability distribution or beliefs about the external states and the actual external states in terms of their mean on the y-axis to show this synchronization manifold here, this lawful mapping that just has to exist because there is this Markov blanket, this separation between the thing and everything else. And in this example, what we're doing is asking the question, can we numerically demonstrate that the internal states hold Bayesian beliefs about the fluctuations and the flow of patterns in the external states? And indeed they do. Here are the, um, the estimated or the, the, the beliefs that are held Bayesian beliefs that are held by the internal states and the actual external states, showing that they lie within the 90% Bayesian credible intervals. And these look very much like what you'd see in electrophysiology if you just look at fluctuations of the internal states um, in response to certain events in the external states when these molecules leave their little soup and they're pulled back in again here. The point I want to make with this um, demonstration is not only that there always exists an interpretation of self-organized or self-evidencing systems endowed with the Markov blanket in terms of belief, building beliefs or having a process that looks as if they are tracking the states of the world, generating their sensations. Um, but more generally, this is just a description, which I'm sure a lot of you will be very familiar with, of self um um, of uh, self-organization that can be described in terms of generalized synchrony or synchronization of chaos. Exactly the sort um, first noted by Huygens in terms of clocks that are suspended from the same beam or wall will ultimately come to synchronize and oscillate uh, in tandem in a synchronous fashion. That's all that's happening here. Um, and indeed, this little drawing by uh, Huygens um, illustrates that from the perspective of the particular partition into internal, active, sensory and external states, where the blanket states um, constitute the beam that's coupling the two uh, penduli here. Um, so from our point of view, um, all we're seeing here is uh, um, an inside out, to use Anil's uh, phrase, view of a completely symmetrical synchronization of chaos or generalized synchrony between two sets of states. Uh, um, I've never said this before, but what I will say to you, I was just wondering whether now, if we replace the external states with something else like me, we now have a mathematical image of the synchrony between a, uh, that characterizes a, di a dyadic interaction between two people. And you can imagine this being uh, many people or many cells, an ensemble of similar kinds of things that are constituted in the, uh, by their Markov blankets, but have some isomorphism in their form, will, in minimizing their joint free energy, necessarily show this kind of generalized synchrony in this harmony that can always be read as one particle or person holding the right kind of beliefs about another kind of person, having a mutual understanding and implicitly a mutual predictability, a shared narrative in the sense that all of this can be described in terms of increasing the evidence for my models, my narrative, my explanation of what's causing my sensations. And of course, 99% of the time, it is you that is causing my sensations and vice versa. Um, so that's the physics part. Uh, just to briefly summarize that, the existence of a particle implies a partition of sy uh, systemic states and states of any given system into internal blanket, namely sensory and active, and external states that are hidden behind the Markov blanket from the point of view of the internal states. And because active states change, but are not changed by external states, they reduce, or they, on average, look as if they are reducing the entropy of blanket states. 
And effectively, this means that action, the active states, will appear to maintain the structural and functional integrity of the blanket, um, a very simple form or basal form of self-assembly, and one could argue um, a very simple form of autopoiesis. Internal states appear to infer the hidden causes of sensory states by increasing Bayesian model evidence and actively influence those causes. And in my world, we refer to that as active influence, just to highlight the crucial role of actively engaging and establishing and selecting the right kind of data that is necessary to establish this kind of um, shared dynamic or synchronization. I'm going to end now by um, rehearsing exactly the same story, but using language much more akin to what um, the first half of Kevin's talk and uh, um, the second half of um, Anil's talk yesterday. So this is the perspective um, that a psychologist or a neurobiologist might bring to the table on exactly the same phenomena. And this usually starts with the notion of the brain as a fantastic organ, uh, um, generating fantasies, or hypotheses, explanations on the inside that then are put to sensory impressions to see whether they are apt to explain what's going on. And if they match, that's fine. If they don't, then you get some kind of Bayesian belief up updating. I find this very nicely demonstrated by this 16th century um, oil painter famed for doing still lives that when viewed from a different direction uh, give you a very different impression. Oops, I got them the wrong way around. So you're meant to see the um, the, the bowl of fruit first um, and then uh, after that the, the face. Um, and if you do see a face now, the point being made here is that you made that face. It's something that you had on the inside in your internal states that is a good explanation for the sensory impressions on your retina or your uh, your, your epithelia. Um, and then this um, notion um, you can find throughout history and philosophy. I'm not a scholar, but um, I, I find uh, beautifully um, summarized by Helmholtz, for example, objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as we have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. Uh, so again, what he's saying is it has to be on the inside before you can explain that sensory impression. Almost exactly the same ideas from people like Richard Gregory, um, the notion of perception as hypothesis testing, ideas used to great effect by people like Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane in machine learning, who indeed built a Helmholtz machine based upon the work of uh, or the uh, Bayesian inference and the work of people like Richard Feynman um, articulating that mathematically in terms of this minimization of free energy. So from our point of view, though, let's just come back to this notion of impressions on the nervous mechanism or sensory impressions on our Markov blanket, the sensory part of our Markov blanket. So I've cartooned that here in terms of some sensory shadows in our sensory veil. And if this dynamics, if this Bayesian mechanics induced by a Markov blanket is true, then what that means is I will look as if I am trying to find explanations for this sensory impression. What caused this particular shadow? So what would that look like? Well, we know exactly what it would look like. It has to be written down in this form. Um, from the physics. So my internal states change in a way that look as if they are trying to minimize this free energy form of this surprisal uh, or self-information here. Um, and it transpires that the functional form of this can be universally interpreted as a prediction error. So what does that mean? It means my internal state, say my neural activity, is changing as a function of my current neural activity plus a prediction error. Um, and if you were an engineer, you'd recognize these as the equations behind predictive coding or Kalman filtering, usually separated into a prediction, what I predict the world will do, given its current, my expectations about its current state, and then an update that is informed by the sensory data that I sample. So what's this free energy gradient here, this prediction error? Well, imagine that I had this sensory impression here, and I had an expectation, a Bayesian belief, that it was caused by a dog. And if I had a generative model that could generate what I would see, if I was correct, I can then generate the prediction and compare it to the sensation to form a prediction error, which is simply the difference. And all this fundamental gradient uh, flow is saying 
this predictive coding or Kalman filtering equation is saying is I'm going to change my mind in the sense of changing my um, internal states and my neuronal states until the prediction error has been eliminated and I've minimized my free energy and the gradients have been destroyed. So is that plausible? Uh, in fact, it's very plausible. It, it uh, speaks to a picture which uh, we'll see in a second uh, where one can look at... Um, I think both Kevin and Anil show, showed sort of cartoons of this. One can look at um, the brain as a hierarchical generative model generating predictions, evaluating the quality of those predictions by evaluating a prediction error, the free energy gradients, and then revising beliefs, doing Bayesian belief updating on the basis of the mismatch. Now, notice at no point will I ever know what's going on out there. Um, all I'm doing is finding a sufficiently good explanation in terms of that which minimizes my prediction errors. In this instance, it was actually a cat. Um, but that's nice because it, what it means is we forget about all the physics and just summarize the existential imperative that inherits from the physics in terms of minimizing prediction error. And there are two ways of doing that. We can either change our minds to make our predictions more like sensations, or we can act on the world to solicit some more sensations that are closer to our predictions. So we can just realize our uh, predictions uh, actively by changing the configuration of our body, for example, or in our internal state, if we talk about interceptive inference and autonomic reflexes, or we can engage uh, motor reflexes, or I can look somewhere else until I see what I expect to see and thereby minimizing my prediction errors. Um, I won't go through this. This is what I would uh, take people through if they did um, uh, neuroscience in terms of the hierarchical organization, this kind of scheme. The basic message behind this architecture is that, say, for example, visual input comes in. It's a receipt of top-down predictions from the visual part of the brain. It elaborates a prediction error that's then sent forward to revise my beliefs to provide better elemental descriptions. But crucially, these expectations are themselves being predicted in a hierarchical sense um, with these top-down descending predictions to produce a prediction error that then drives the higher level expectations, more abstract representations to provide an account of what's going on below. This is exactly what Kevin was talking about yesterday in terms of this layer or level of the hierarchy, looking at informing and being informed by the level below and so on to any hierarchical depth uh, required. Uh, the particular twist in this graphic, though, is that um, it incorporates action. So here there's another kind of prediction error that comes from the muscles in my eye that I could predict, and I could use a prediction error to infer where my eye was currently pointing. But there's a much simpler way that I can minimize these prediction errors. I can just change the stretch of my muscle to match the predictions of the stretch receptors. And what I'm describing here is this a classical reflex arc in uh, motor control. If I was doing interceptive inference, this would be an autonomic reflex. Basically, actively and reflexively um, minimizing prediction errors in relation to deeply hierarchically informed predictions that are generated by my model that I'm trying to maximize the evidence for. Um, so that's um the basic story um it, i just want to fi finish the story um with saying well actually not quite um before i do that let me just uh, illustrate the kind of active inference and the kind of sort of uh, engagement with the world and the one way of establishing very simple synchrony with the world that inherits from the architecture i've just shown you um what we did here is basically equip a a synthetic subject with a, a generative model that had dynamics, autonomy, and this kind of itinerancy that we, um, was implicitly referred to yesterday um, in the form of a, a central pattern generator, and then map this abstract dynamic to some point in extrapersonal space. And we told the synthetic subject, or well, part of its generative model was that there was an invisible point that was moving around and there was an invisible spring that was pulling her finger um, towards the moving point. So that means that this synthetic subject is now expecting to, predicting to feel her hand being moved around and see her hand being moved around. But 
because she also has reflexes, then she's going to automatically fulfill the predictions of the hand movements and cause the hand to move, thereby fulfilling the visual predictions. And with this very simple kind of reflexive setup, uh, we can simulate quite realistic biological kinds of motion and also by simply removing the proprioceptive or the movement sensing information, we can simulate not just action, but what it would be like to observe something very similar performing the same action, but just visually without the proprioceptive um, input. Um, so that kind of simulation rests upon this sort of overall architecture that we get some sim sensations and that they um, are used to do our Bayesian belief updating by minimizing this uh, variation free energy or or what to do next and those uh, predictions are then used to um, uh, generate action and this rests on the um, the markov blanket that i showed right at the beginning of the presentation what i'm going to do now is make one very very simple move and take this sparse coupling that defines the thing from everything else, make it slightly sparser in a very simple but very important way. I'm going to remove the influence of my active states on my internal states. And as soon as I do that, then from the point of view of the internal states, my active states now become vicarious causes of my sensory states, which means that there now exists an interpretation of my internal state as modeling not just the external states as causing or using uh, a model of the external states to predict the sensory states, but the external states and the active states now become causes of my sensations. So now I have a model of the causes of my sensations that include my own actions. And it's this particular move um, that I'm um, suggesting or from the point of view of simulating these kinds of uh, so this kind of self-organization, may be a necessary move to introduce agency in the sense that uh, agents will have some notion, some or at least can be described as having some sense of their own agency, the consequences of their own action, because the um, the, con the their own action is now not directly accessible. It can only be ob uh, observed via the sensory consequences that therefore have to be modelled. And this takes us into a slightly different and um, I think richer world where you now have the notion of um, a model that incorporates explicitly the consequences of the agent's action. I'm not saying at this stage there's any awareness or sentience of that agency, but just it is there that is then used to plan into the future, um, to evaluate the different consequences of different actions, so that you are now implicitly introducing the notion of planning and a temporal depth into the dynamics that then provide the predictions of what I'm actually going to do next. I won't go through this in any detail, but just use it to make the point that the underlying maths is quite simple um, and has a telonomy or, uh, or at least an interpretation in terms of things that people in statistics, machine learning and economics would recognize immediately in terms of things like risk and ambiguity or accuracy and complexity and intrinsic and extrinsic value, um, where it turns out that all of these quantities that underwrite the planning that ensues from having to have a model of the consequences of my action are well established in uh, different kinds of literature. So for example, the intrinsic value is just um, the quantity used in visual search known as Bayesian surprise. It's also exactly the same quantity uh, underwrites something I mentioned earlier, which is the principle of maximum mutual information or the minimum redundancy principle. Um, it is, uh, effectively, the thing that drives our curiosity. It's the uh, the thing that minimizes expected surprise by maximizing information gain. Um, and I can sort of strip away various sources of uncertainty and get back to expected utility. But I really want to focus in the, in the final slide on um, this epistemic affordance that falls out and is a necessary consequence of just having a model of the consequences of my actions in the future. Um, 
that I repeat entail a degree of planning. And if I'm say planning to where am I going to look next, I'm going to look to the, uh, I'm going to make the next eye movement that resolves the greatest amount of uncertainty about the states of affairs out there, because that has the greatest intrinsic value, it has the greatest intrinsic motivation, it has the greatest epistemic importance. Um, it is salient for me, it has meaning for me in terms of what I don't know in, uh, about the world beyond my sensorium. And you can uh, uh, write this down um, with particular examples and produce salience maps um, that do actually uh, describe um, quite accurately the empirical behavior of people choosing where to um, look next. And indeed, you can simulate this in terms of a little agent, this particular agent, a very simple universe. Um, she was either in universe that where all her um, sensory input was being caused by an upright face, a sideways face or an inverted uh, face. And by carefully choosing where to look next, noting that she could only sample a very small part of the visual field with her fovea, as indicated by these um, images here and this uh, movie here, she can choose the best places to look to maximize this Bayesian surprise, to maximize uh, or respond to these epistemic affordances uh, and resolve her uncertainty about what is she is looking at, and she's indeed correctly inferring she's looking at an upright face. So all of that can be much more gracefully summarized by Helmholtz um, as follows. Each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we've understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us, that is their existence in definite spatial relations. Um, and with that, it only remains uh, for me to thank those people whose ideas I've been talking about, and of course, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed.